Okay, hello all. We will go ahead and get started, although I know some people are still logging on. My name is Mimi Mudd, and I want to welcome you to the first live webinar of the Fall 2024 Family Webinar Series. Tonight, I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah Edmondson, who's the Associate Director for Student Involvement, and Zachary Littrell, Assistant Director for Sorority and Fraternity Life. We're excited that you've chosen to join us for tonight's conversation about student engagement and sorority and fraternity life, some logistical information before we get started. So first, we wanna make sure you know how to submit questions during this webinar. You will see that we've given you the ability to ask questions via the Q&A feature in Zoom. Our staff with Student Transitions and Family Programs will help field these questions throughout the webinar. So please feel free to plug in questions as you hear the information and um, answers to other questions. To make sure you know how to use the Q&A feature, please share the city from which you are watching and then we will name a few of them on air in just a little bit. Second, we'll be showing a PowerPoint created by our panelists during tonight's webinar. However, if you prefer to download the PowerPoint as a PDF and be able to follow along, we are going to share that link in the chat right now. And then third, these webinars are recorded and um, next week, by early next week, probably Monday, they'll be uploaded on our families.wustel.edu website. In a moment, we'll hear from our panelists about student involvement, um, sorority fraternity life on campus. If something they say sparks a question, don't forget to send it to us using that Q&A feature. And then before passing things along to Sarah and Zachary, I'll share some of the places from which we are joining. So tonight we have people from Atlanta, Georgia, Boston, Massachusetts, and Chicago, Illinois. So hello, everyone. Now, since I know you all wanna hear more about student engagement and sorority and fraternity life on campus, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it on over to Sarah and Zachary. Hello and welcome. We're glad to have you here with us tonight. I'm Sarah Edmondson. I'm the Associate Director for Student Involvement. I use she, her pronouns, and I oversee the team in campus. We, Zach and I are both part of Campus Life, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Um, but I oversee the team that includes all of our staff that work with all of our recognized student groups and just student involvement generally, including managing um, everything that goes into managing student groups, re-registration, starting new groups, um, student group conduct, all of those pieces, as well as our kind of back-end software pieces. And then I also serve as the primary advisor to the Student Union, which is our undergraduate student government on campus. I'll let Zach introduce himself as well. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Zachary Littrell. I use he, they pronouns. Excited to be here with you all tonight. Um, I currently serve as our assistant director of sorority and fraternity life. And so in my role, um, I have kind of broad oversight of our entire fraternity and sorority life community. Um, so all chapters across our governing councils, um, oversight with residential life of our fraternity houses, um, and then kind of some joint effort with the St. Louis and other St. Louis universities um, as we work with our citywide uh, MPHC. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and I serve on our team that is responsible mostly for kind of large scale programmatic efforts that we'll touch on a little bit, um, such as, you know, alternative breaks, our in the loop programming, um, and some of our more signature programs, such as WILD. Uh, but we'll get into that later. So, Campus Life's mission is that Campus Life empowers students to discover and define themselves and their communities through advising programs and resources. And we'll talk more about what that is, but um, for a lot of you, if you went to a college, you are probably familiar with the Student Activities Office, which is largely how you could classify campus life. So really kind of all of those co-curricular engagement pieces. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but to hope, hopefully make some parallels to other opportunities um, that or uh, experiences you might be familiar with from your own college experience. So again, who is Campus Life? We are really made up of kind of five or six different functional areas as we call it, but really we all work together to serve students and their engagement across campus. So event management and operations, uh, those that team really works with both managing several of our spaces on campus, both for faculty staff reservations, but also really supporting our student groups as they reserve space on campus. Leadership programs, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Programming and campus vibrancy, we'll talk more about that too, those large programmatic efforts on campus. And then student involvement, which is the team I oversee, like I mentioned, working with student union, our undergraduate student government and student groups. 
and then business operations. And business operations really is supporting our student union finances. So our student union allocates uh, roughly four and a half million dollars, which is really incredible to our student groups across campus. And that business operations team really serves in processing all of those transactions. So kind of together, we really make up campus life as a whole. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means for your students. Um, and so one of the big pieces that we typically talk about is the other classroom. So what is that student engagement piece? What are those leadership pieces? Um, and so really we're looking at the co-curricular experience that your student is having. So what are the abilities or what are the ways that they can get involved outside of the classroom? Um, that could be student employment through campus life. It could be some of our passive programming that happens in the Danforth University Center or the DUC. Um, it could be helping someone find a student organization to get involved in or find the place they belong in our fraternity and sorority life community. And so it's really helping them build out that co-curricular experience piece. It's helping them develop and find community, whether it's people who are showing up to the same events um, week after week, uh, making new friends, finding new people. Uh, we also are a very good place to get involved in leadership, whether it's within their student groups. Um, we have a brand new leadership uh, department, a team under our campus life that partners a lot with the Bauer Leadership Academy as well. Uh, and so leadership is kind of one of our newer pieces that we've started building out um, in 2024. We're very excited to see kind of where it looks in the future. And then also helping students find those, uh, the way they can make an impact on campus. Um, something that we're really trying to push this year is that leadership isn't just a title. It's the way that you're able to get involved and make change and make impact. And that's one of those pieces that we're hoping that people are able to find through their involvement in campus life. And so when we talk about that co-curricular experience, there's a lot of ways that students could get involved here on campus. Um, so as we mentioned, we have a ton of student groups that we're able to be involved in, and we'll talk a little bit about more about those in a minute. Um, they can join sorority and fraternity life, um, community service or service learning. We have a ton of opportunities available for that as well, um, whether that is through campus life with our um, alternative breaks, our days of service, um, also through the ability to get involved um, in other civic pieces through a couple other campus partners. We have a ton of student employees in campus life. We usually hire around 70 or so student employees. So it's a great way for that to build that co-curricular experience as well. Leadership positions in clubs and organizations. You could do undergraduate research. Um, you could just participate in events. Um, you could be involved in athletics and our sports clubs. You could form study groups and even some of the residential community activities that are being put out there are kind of what we mean when we talk about that co-curricular experience. I apologize. I'm out and I am not actually see the power. I'm not entirely sure where we are. So, Zach, if you could continue. Absolutely. Oh, and then hopefully I'll be able to see it soon. Not a problem. So when we talk about campus life, one of the things we want to talk about is our student involvement team and what that looks like. So when we talk about student involvement, something we always like to highlight is that over 80 percent of WashU students are involved in a student group. Um, that is a, a very high number. So we're seeing that 80 percent of the entire student body, uh, the undergraduate student body, is involved in some type of student organization that is registered here on campus. And so what that means is we're seeing all of those students um, involved in a variety of student groups um, that I'm going to let Sarah talk about right now. Yes, thanks for being with me. I'm now I'm able to see it. I can jump back in. Um, yeah, so we do have over 400 student groups on campus, as Zach said, and they are really split across 18 categories. We do see, you know, over 80% of our students are involved in a student group. Certainly not the only way students can get involved in campus. There's a lot of different opportunities. We'll talk more about kind of some of those cross campus engagement pieces, but there are a lot of opportunities within our student groups to find those connections. Um, and student groups can really serve a lot of different purposes. So they can be kind of that academic pre-professional, right? Really supporting that curricular mission of the university. Um, we have a lot of student groups related to pre-law, pre-med, all of those different areas, um, all of our various STEM groups, certainly, you know, with support from the McKelvey School of Engineering. And so really they can be kind of tied to that academic mission. They can also be tied to those affinity spaces. So we have a lot of cultural diversity and inclusion groups, affinity spaces, religious and spiritual groups. Um, so students are really then connecting in those spaces much more from an identity lens and finding that affinity space. And then we also have kind of our performing arts or sports club groups. Um, and we have many more categories that are not listed here, as you can see, but there are really spaces to connect with all different parts of a student's identity and what they're looking for. Every one of our student groups is also assigned a campus life advisor. Most of our staff in campus life are what we call a campus life advisor. So 
each campus life advisor has at least one or multiple categories of student groups and all of the groups that fall underneath those categories and are really helping them work through planning, um, sometimes helping them deal with conflict if they don't have a separate faculty staff advisor who might also be helping with that. Um, and figuring out all those process questions, helping groups re-register, helping students start new groups. Campus Life Advisors can also talk to students about generally just how to get involved on campus. So we really do want folks to know that the Campus Life Advisors, our Campus Life staff are a resource for students when they're just trying to figure out where they fit. And whether that's with something housed within Campus Life or not, we want our students to find their spaces on campus. So one of the ways that students can find out where what all of our various groups are is what we call WUGO, which stands for the Washington University Group Organizer. It is a software platform that we use that manages all of our student groups across campus. There's also a lot of college departments or university departments, as well as um, department sponsored groups. So we talk about recognized student groups. We have about 400 of those, but we also have several groups that are sponsored by academic departments and different places across campus, including the med school and groups that cross kind of different schools and colleges. And so really students can find all of those different pieces in the WashU group organizer. Um, within each group, a student can click in and you can actually see this without even logging in. So parents, you can see this stuff as well uh, without even being logged into the system, but students can always see a little bit more as they log in with their Wustle key. And within there, if you clicked on a group, you can find out when are they meeting, where do they meet, uh, what is the mission of that group? What, because some of them have really great creative names, but that doesn't necessarily tell me like, what is that group about, right? So going in and kind of reading their constitution or looking at their mission statement to see what is that group all about? Um, you can search by name certainly, but then also if you'll see on the screen, there's a button, a blue button that says categories and the categories can help you find groups ranked by different categories, right? So like I said, those cultural groups, those diversity and inclusion groups, sports clubs, all of those different groups are assigned those categories and you can search through the categories to see what kind of group might a student be looking for to join. So when we talk about leadership and kind of some ways that you can get involved in leadership and really develop those leadership pieces um, through campus life, one of the things that we like to talk about is student union. Um, so student union is our student government here on campus. It's comprised of uh, three branches. So it's our executive branch, um, our, uh, our Senate and our treasury. There are a couple other auxiliary groups, um, the con council, which is the judicial wing of student union, and then um, we also have the Elections Commission. It's a very, it's a high level premier way to get involved um, and students can start running early. Um, we have uh, typically positions available um, in the fall and spring elections both semesters. Student I was muted that whole time. Um, and so my apologies team. Uh, and so when we talk about leadership and ways to get involved uh, on campus, student union is one of the really good ways that students are able to get involved. Uh, it is kind of a premier way for students able to get involved. Uh, they can start with the Senate or Treasury. Elections are typically held in both the fall and spring. First year students are able to kind of jump right in and get involved. Um, it's made up of a few different branches, the legislative branch, um, our exec, uh, Senate, Treasury, Constitution Council, which is the judicial branch of Student Union, and then also our Elections Commission. One of the pieces, though, that's exciting the Student Union has recently put into play is the Student Union Leadership Award, which is an award that recognizes um, actively involved students um, who have made differences throughout their leadership time or through their time in leadership in student groups at Washington University. Um, students are also able to get involved in student group leadership. Um, so that's any of our 400 groups that they're able to get involved in and kind of get involved in leadership, whether that's as a committee chairman, the president, the vice president, the treasurer, just the ability to really get involved and make a difference in student organizations. Um, then we have the Bauer Leaders Academy, which is a division of student affairs initiative that is also partnering with Campus Life. Um, we have a leadership branch in our office that works a lot with the BLA. Um, we saw a lot of really good effort made this first year with first year students this year where they talked about purpose statements and kind of what is the purpose that a student has as they work through um, their few years in college, through their life. Uh, and then also we do a lot with strengths find, the strengths finder assessment by Gallup. Um, we have a robust team of strengths coaches who are able to work with students and really help them figure out the way that their strengths play out and play into the things that they want to do moving forward. And then we have a strengths week coming up, I believe in October as well. 
Uh, and so those are some of the things that we'd highlight really when it comes to leadership. Sarah, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything on the leadership piece. I'm so sorry. I think I'm having Wi-Fi issues. I just keep getting kicked out. Um, no, I think Zach mostly covered it. Um, what I'll say about kind of the leadership piece is, so we, the Bauer Leaders Academy is, as we mentioned kind of at the start, is a newly formed area that really brings together leadership efforts across campus. And within that, so they're talking about the academic spaces and the co-curricular spaces. Um, within Campus Life, we have some staff that work as part of the Bauer Leaders Academy. And a few of the ways that they're working on is really that non-positional leadership like we talked about. Certainly also supporting positional leaders, you know, our student group leaders, our student union leaders, our sorority and fraternity life leaders, as we've mentioned before, but also that students can really be a leader in any space that they're in. And that really comes back to that sense of purpose, right? So talking about those purpose statements, all of our first year students, our incoming first year students this year during orientation really went through a purpose statement activity. So that'll be a thing that now students coming in will continue to have. Um, but also any student that was already here that might've missed that can certainly come and connect with the Bauer Leaders Academy and do go through that purpose activity as well. But it's really helping students connect to what is their purpose and using that. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in later slides, but using that and the language, the common language of strengths, which we'll talk about more as well, to really maximize, uh, you know, who am I? What do I care about? And how does that lead me to drive towards the things that I want to do, right? Uh, whether that be in the career space, in like outside of the career space, both now during their time as a student and when they graduate from here and go out. And so really kind of drawing that sense of leadership back to that sense of purpose. And again, that doesn't really have to be related to a position, right? You can be a leader in your workplace. You can be a leader in your home. You can be a leader in your friend group. It doesn't really matter where you find yourself and you don't have to have a title to be a leader. Um, so within that, the Bauer Leaders Academy is really our group on campus that's also facilitating the strengths finder assessment. And we'll talk about that more on, I think the next slide. Um, and then leadership week as X talked about. So Gallup strengths or Clifton strengths or strengths finder, as you might know it, it's had a couple different names over the years, but Gallup is the company that now owns the strengths, the Clifton strengths um, tool. And it's a tool that helps individuals identify their talents, develop those talents into strengths and apply their strengths in experiences that will help them be successful both inside and outside of the classroom. Um, many employers use the language of Gallup Strengths. Gallup is a big data company, as you probably know. Many, many employers across the world use kind of that common language. And it really comes from that asset-based mindset, right, of everybody is naturally good at something. And um, it's, this says that, that in that last bullet point, right, so increase your personal awareness, understanding of self, and your individual motivations while enhancing skills that already show up naturally, right? So really, these are characteristics that every one of us already has, and then kind of investing in them, being aware of them, knowing how to develop them and use them well, can turn them into strengths, and we can use them in all areas of our life. Um, and so students who take that Clifton Strengths inventory will receive their personalized insights and their opportunities for self-reflection. They can meet with a leadership coach who can talk through, how do I use this? How do I connect with my sense of purpose? How do I employ this in, in my classes, in my major? in my career search, all of those different pieces, even in their, their student group activity or student group leadership, um, everywhere that they show up as a person, they can employ those strengths and apply that. Um, so we really wanna appoint you know, students that are already on campus, all of our first year students have the opportunity to go through that. If they didn't complete it, they still can um, during orientation, but then also any of our existing students that are already here can connect with the Bauer Leaders Academy. If they wanna take that tool, and connect with a coach and um, work through that assessment. All right, and so now one of the teams that uh, we're gonna talk about is our programming campus vibrancy teams. This is the team that I serve on um, under Karen Smith, our Associate Director for Programming and Campus Vibrancy. The PCV team, as we typically call it, is a pretty, is a team that has a lot of range on the events we do. So we oversee a lot of our campus life programming. So there's some of our more staple events that you typically hear about. Duck and Donuts, the first Friday of every month, uh, Tuesday Tea, every other Tuesday, where we just kind of do some passive programming throughout the semester so that way students know who campus life is and kind of some ways that you can show up and, and do these um, low commitment events. 
We also have Fall Fest coming up this semester. We'll have Spring Fest in the spring. And so it's one of those pieces where we're really trying to make sure that students know who Campus Life is, know where to find us, so we're able to get involved in the programming that we're doing. Uh, we do in the loop programming that also falls under the PCV area. That's a way to get students out into experiencing out into experience St. Louis. This is usually this is only for first year students. Uh, is a way to get them to really get out, see the city, and fall in love with it in the same way that we all have. Um, uh, working for Washington University in St. Louis or being from the area, it's we typically have done city games, city two games, battle hawks games. Um, we had some groups do some service, I believe. As a part of our in the loop this year, we do the zoo, Bush Stadium tour, some of the more classic St. Louis things. Um, we also have our service and immersive experiences area. So that's where we see our alternative breaks, um, our days of service, really ways that students get involved in doing service in and around the St. Louis community to really give back to St. Louis uh, while students are here. We have our sorority and fraternity life area, which we will talk about, I think, in the final two slides that I will talk a ton more on when we get to it. And then finally, our campus life marketing is falls under us. So PCV is responsible for a lot of the marketing decisions that come out of the campus life area. We have a campus, we have a marketing team, which does a lot of our in-house marketing. It's another student, it is typically led by students. So it's a student employment team is what our marketing team is led by one of our coordinators. It's another good way for students to get involved um, in our on-campus employment experiences. Uh, so some of the programming that we touched on earlier. So under our programming, we see Wild, which is our walk and lie down. It's our end of year uh, concert that we have in April on the last day of classes. Night at the Pageant is our fall version of it. It's a little smaller. Happens at the Pageant, which is a venue close to campus on the Del Mar Loop. We do fall, fall and spring fest. We did Camp Mud last year. We had fire pits out on Mud Field. Students were able to make s'mores, play games, enjoy live music. We have in the Lou um, social board programming. SPB is a part of Student Union and also advised out of the PCV team. It does a lot of events that are open, sometimes class specific, sometimes they are open to everyone. I know they have a senior movie night coming up tomorrow. Uh, they've done tailgates with athletics before in the past. And so it's really just another way for students to find some social programming outlets on campus. Um, our service and immersive experiences. So we have all breaks, day of service. Um, Adam Brock, our coordinator, is always happy to find people for those individual or group service experiences. He's always quick to connect people with our community partners as well. So if you're looking to get involved and give back into the St. Louis community, it's another good area to, to talk with and meet. And so finally, sorority and fraternity life. Uh, so this is the area that I know the best uh, and that I can talk to the best. So we have 26 chapters across four councils here at Washington University in St. Louis. So we have NALFO, uh, which is the National Association of Latino Fraternal Organizations. We have Alpha Psi Lambda Fraternity. They are a co-ed organization. Um, we have all nine of the Divine Nine organizations people are able to join. So our historically Black fraternities and sororities. Six of them are citywide chapters, which means the charter is held at Harris Stowe State University, which is an HBCU in St. Louis. Uh, but students from any of the St. Louis area universities are able to join those chapters. Um, we have three that are chartered at Washington University in St. Louis, so Phi Beta Sigma, Zeta Phi Beta, and Sigma Gamma Rho. Those are all local to Washington University, um, so every student who joins there is from WashU. Um, we have the Women's Panhellenic Association, so those are um, our historically white sororities. We have six on campus. We do a deferred recruitment for Panhellenic and IFC, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and then for the Interfraternity Council, we have 10 fraternities. Sigma Chi is returning to our community this fall, uh, which we're excited to welcome them back. Uh, and so I know, I think I heard that there was a question beforehand about the community size and kind of what does that look like. At the end of the spring, our community was just under 1,200 students, which accounted for about 17% of the undergraduate student body. Uh, it's 17 or 18% somewhere in there. But we are a good size of the undergraduate population. Um, I think our IFC average chapter size was about 55. Our Panhellenic average chapter size was in the 90s or right at 90. Uh, and MPHC, it's a little different because of the citywide chapters and people can join from there. But Alpha Psi Lambda also came in at about 53 members. And so the community is good size. It's seen a lot of growth in the past few years, which we've been very excited about and kind of the direction that we're able to go. Um, we know that students are also trying to charter an Asian interest sorority under the NAPA umbrella. And so we're seeing a lot of really exciting movement, exciting growth in our fraternity story life community over the past 18 months. And so we'd love to stay connected with everyone. Uh, we have a Facebook uh, at Campus Life Washington University. Our Instagram is the most active, though. Um, we have that at Campus Life Wash U. We, we are active on that all the time. We post often and frequently. Uh, we always recommend that students get involved 
uh, or at least follow the Instagram so they know kind of what we have going on. We post all of our events, all of our news. We repost student events to our stories. We want to make sure that even if you're just following us on Instagram, you're finding a way to get involved uh, here at WashU. You can also always email us if you have questions, campuslife at washu.edu. Um, and if you're on campus, you're also welcome to pop into the duck at Anforth University Center and come see us in Suite 270 or 160 if you're on the first floor. Okay, great. Thank you both so much for that information. I will go ahead and get us started, kind of kick us off with the question and answers. And then just a reminder to our attendees um, to plug in any questions you might have via the Q&A feature. So first question for you both to answer um, that I know a lot of parents and family members might be wondering, is it ever too late in a student's undergraduate career to get involved? No, it's not. Um, we have opportunities to get involved all the time. So WILD is on the very last day of classes in the spring. And so even if it is their senior year, the very last day of classes, they can still attend WILD. And we would consider that getting involved, right? Um, there's there's a spectrum to involvement of, you know, you're really, really engaged. You're an officer of a student group or something to that effect, um, all the way to your, you know, kind of low level involvement. of You just show up to a one-time event and that is perfectly okay. Students really should pick what makes sense for them. And no, it is never too late to get involved. I will say it is, and Zach can really speak to this, like, right, you might hit a point during your second semester of senior year where it is a little too late to join a sorority or fraternity because the recruitment deadlines have already passed. But um, I might be saying that wrong, so I'll let Zach really speak to that. Um, but it is never too late to get involved. And please reach out if you have any questions, and we'd love to help you get connected. I'm going to unmute knowing full while my dogs are barking at something outside. Um, and so if we hear them, my apologies, there they are. Uh, and so it is never too late to get involved on campus, whether it's coming to some of our events. Um, I know that even if you in your second semester, senior year, we have had people join fraternities and sororities. Uh, and so anything is always possible. It just really depends on what is the experience you're looking for? What do you want to get out of it? How does joining and get involved kind of help you realize what you're looking for? Uh, but it is never too late to get involved. Great, thank you both. Okay, next question that we have, um, a general kind of question directed mainly about sorority and fraternity life, but I think some of this also dips into student groups. Um, can you all provide some more information on any type of like professional, honorary, or business related fraternity or sorority? Um, what are the options or where can people go to find what those options are? Yeah, so I can really jump in here first. Um, so really, really, we would ca categorize those groups under our academic and pre-professional uh, category. So if you're searching through Wugo, check the academic and pre-professional. Um, because when we use the fraternity sorority tag, we're really talking about the social sor sororities and fraternities, but we do have several. Uh, we also have an honorary category. Student groups get to pick for themselves which category they fall under, so I would actually check both of those um, because I know some live in the honorary and some live in the academic and pre-professional category, um, but we do have several. We've got, I know we've got pre-med ones, pre-law ones, business ones, um, political science. I'm trying to think of the other pre-professional or academic um, fraternities that we have. Uh, I think we have, oh, and I'm going to forget the name of it, but there's one that is like merit-based. Um, I don't think it's like a um, like major specific. Oh, I know we have that one as well. And if somebody <laughs> knows the name or, or is curious about a specific group, please let us know and we can certainly look into that or you can check it on Wugo. Um, are you talking about Phi Beta Kappa or ODK, Omega, Omicron Delta Kappa? I think those are two well-known yeah. large honoraries. Yes, it's one of those. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, we definitely do have a robust business fraternity and kind of pre-professional fraternity scene as well. Um, they are not housed under me. Um, I oversee our social fraternities and sororities, as Sarah had mentioned. Uh, but we do have a pretty robust scene. Uh, they typically do their recruitment in the fall and the spring in the same way that fraternities and sororities do. Um, they are 
uh, really kind of operating very similarly to our social fraternities and sororities. Um, students actually often join both a business fraternity or professional fraternity and a social fraternity or sorority. Um, so there's often some level of overlap there as well. Great, thank you. Okay, then we have a few questions coming in specific to recruitment um, and intake. So kind of like a general question about what does that process look like? Um, it sounds like it's in the spring semester. And I guess, who can they go to to learn more about the schedule? Kind of like what days, what those days look like, et cetera. Um, all good questions. So since WashU uses a deferred recruitment uh, model, so first year students are not able to join social fraternities and sororities until their second semester. And um, they also have to meet a pretty healthy eligibility criteria that we have. So students have to sign up that they're interested in joining a fraternity or sorority uh, through our WUGO form. Then they also would have to go through our verification and eligibility process. And that process we typically look for, are you enrolled as a full-time student? Do you have a 2.5 GPA? Um, do you have, like, were you enrolled full-time the most immediate previous semester? We do a conduct verification just to make sure that there are no disciplinary issues. Um, some groups might have other criteria as well that they look for, but those are kind of the big things that we at WashU look for to determine a student's eligibility. Um, once you're verified, you're able to join any of our organizations on campus. I'll talk a little bit about how each of the councils do it. So Alpha Psi Lambda, they do intake each semester, fall and spring. You have to attend informational meetings to show that you're interested, uh, express that you're interested, and then they will take a set number of uh, PNMs each semester. It has varied pretty greatly. They've grown pretty rapidly. Um, I think they usually take somewhere between like eight and 15 people usually each semester. It just really kind of depends on what they feel like they have the capacity for. To join our MPHC organizations, it's a little different. Um, they do intake. It depends uh, when they will do intake. It could be in the fall. It could be in the spring. Um, often it is when they feel it is right for them to do. Um, again, it's the matter of filling out the verification form, attending their events. The best way to find out which MPHC organizations are hosting intake is to follow their Instagram accounts individually. Um, we try to post at our WashU MPHC account if we know someone's hosting an informational, but it really just depends on if they are hosting it. If you can find it, some organizations will put up flyers in the Danforth University Center, um, but intake varies greatly across those organizations, but you would kind of express to one that you are interested, but only one uh, as kind of the general decorum around joining an MPHC organization. For Panhellenic, we open, we plan to open registration in early November for the Women's Panhellenic Association. If anyone wants to go through that recruitment process, recruitment is in January this year. Um, it'll be the second week of school as when we're planning to host recruitment. It usually takes place a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday with bid day on Monday. Uh, so that is our current recruitment time frame. We anticipate opening registration, I believe, November 3rd. We typically close it um, right around the start of the spring semester. And so that is when you would sign up, you'd run through the verification process, then we would go into our recruitment, which lasts three rounds here. We do a 642 model um, as the maximum number of invites you can get back. And then for IFC, uh, you typically would express your interest to the fraternities that are participating in recruitment. Um, you would show up to their open rounds. We do recruitment in two phases for IFC, the open round and the closed round. Um, open, anyone can show up to the event that happens. Closed round is typically a more invite only list. Uh, and so it's just making a good impression on people during the open round, making good friends, building good relationships to get that invite back into the second close round. Uh, and I think those are kind of the ways that we look at intake currently, or the ways that you can join our community right now. Thank you. And then there was a follow-up question specific to recruitment and intake. So what support systems are in place for any questions or concerns a student might have during that process? We had a parent or family member write in, like expressing their student was a little concerned about inclusivity um, with the recruitment process. Um, I would feel free to reach out to me. Um, I typically am pretty quick to respond to people who reach out with any concerns or want to talk to your concerns. Um, I'm sure that I could also enlist the help of our Panhellenic Executive Board uh, to be able to kind of like talk to students who might be interested and have some concerns about what the, the, the general demeanor of the community looks like. Um, or kind of generally what it looks like to join. Um, I think that we have done a lot of work over the past, um, I've only been here for 18 months, but I think there's been a lot of really good work made in the past few years um, with our fraternity short death community to really build on what it looks like to kind of be more diverse, be more inclusive, and be 
more, I don't want to say panhellenic, but that is kind of the word I want to use. I think that they do a really good job of building that inclusive piece, building that um, belonging piece among their membership. Um, I hear all the time from our women about how they feel like they belong, how they feel like they always have made the right decision when they join. And so I think that they've done a really good job of building those pieces out in the community. And so I think that I'd be happy to talk to anyone who has concerns. I'd be happy to see if our Panhellenic executive board are willing to talk with uh, women who might have some concerns. I think the easiest way to really get to know is just to kind of talk with our Panhellenic women. They are able to talk with PNMs uh, through positive Panhellenic contact through the NPC. And so I think that it never hurts to have those conversations and I'm always happy to have them. I'm sure that our Panhellenic officers are as well. Great, thank you. Okay, um, now I have a question about just how do WashU students balance their time, like committing it to student groups um, in addition to academics? What do you all tend to see? Yeah, so it's it's really a spectrum. Um, students come in with a variety of ability in terms of kind of managing their time and um, and we see that represented in kind of how they engage with their co-curricular co-curricular experience. So what I will say is that WashU, you know, it is a very uh, academically rigorous institution, and um, certainly students are very qualified by the time they get here, right? Um, and so we do see as things ebb and flow throughout the year, we see when finals are happening that student group activity or that co-curricular activity really does die off. We also have a few, uh, you know, restrictions in place to help support that. So we don't allow any student group programming during reading week or finals each semester. And we also don't allow it during the first week of class in the fall, because we really believe it's important for students to kind of have that mental space to focus on their academics at, at certainly the most stressful points of the year. Um, but students really, you choose how much you engage. Students get to choose how much they engage. So we don't necessarily have like restrictions on like you can't be in 10 groups or whatever, right? Students can pick for that for what they want. Um, I will say at least 60% of our students are in more than one student group. So we do see a very high level of involvement. Um, WashU is really special compared to every other institution I've been at and really every other institution I've seen that are our students are, they're really driving the campus experience here. Um, I, I mentioned before the student union has, they get to allocate four and a half million dollars just to student groups for their events and travel and experiences. And um, that's really unique and that's really special. And students are certainly creating the majority of the programming on campus and then engaging in it. Um, but students can also opt out of that at any time. You know, we really want students to to find that healthy excellence. That's one of the anchors of the Division of Student Affairs, where we want students to find that balance of what is the right mix. No involvement is usually not great. We know from research that students who do get involved persist at much higher levels and, and do better academically. And I know Zach could certainly speak to that within the sorority fraternity community that um, they typically outperform uninvolved students or, or kind of the regular student body averages across campus. Um, but we also know that too much involvement can also be detrimental, right? And so it's really up to the student. This is part of their experience in kind of self-managing is learning what is the right mix? When do I opt out when it's too much? Um, and how do I stay involved? Because those social connections are also hugely important to a student's career. Did you want to add to that, Zachary? Um, I can. I always do love to talk about that our fraternities and sororities are often performing above the all campus averages. Um, so we usually see our fraternities and sororities do better on the whole. Our our all S all SFL GPA is usually above the all campus average. Our all men's is either at or above the all men's average. Our all women's average is usually above the all women's average. Uh, our all sorority averages are usually above the all women's average. Um, and so we see a lot of success in fraternities and sororities. I think that's often. Um, due to just kind of that built-in support network that exists. They're often assigning upperclassmen mentors to be able to assist and help. Uh, but that is not something that I think is unique to our fraternity and sorority life community. Um, I do think I've heard that from some of our other student groups that our students are involved in. Uh, and so it's really those pieces of, I really think it comes down to like finding the involvement with people who also support you, which I think that our student groups um, can do a pretty good job at as well. Thank you.
And then kind of staying in this vein of like time balancing, we did get a question about the like general um, social calendar of Wash U sorority and fraternity life chapters, um, what that looks like. And then we'll start there and then we'll move to the follow up. Uh, that is a great question about what generally what does the social calendar look like for fraternities and sororities? Um, I think it really kind of is dependent on each organization. I think for the most part, you're going to see kind of very classic um, events happening, as I will call them. I think that some of our uh, fraternities typically host um, parties in their on-campus houses um, on the weekends. Um, there is a set number on how many people can host each night and how many events can happen each weekend. Um, there is, we often see our organizations do uh, mixers and date parties. I know there's a date party happening, I think, tomorrow that a sorority has planned. Um, and so really the calendar, I think they do a lot of like very standard social events, as I will call them. Um, they have parties in the facilities on campus. They have date parties. They have mixers. They host um, events that are um, kind of out in the community. They go out into the community. They do service based events that are also off like I've seen mixers that are service based events um, where they're mixing with another sorority or they're doing a day party with a sorority or they're hosting an event with another fraternity. Um, and so I think it, it feels very uh, normal, like a standard social event calendar. Uh, it just really depends on where we're at in the year on kind of what kind of events they're hosting or what they're doing. Uh, we have to see our brotherhood or sisterhood events around kind of the bigger events that are happening. I know there's always going to be a Super Bowl event or there's always going to be a college football um, championship event. It just really kind of depends on what's happening and kind of what how they want to host an event. But it's a pretty normal calendar of events that they do. Um, every group, though, is different on how like the frequency of what events they're putting on. And I think it just comes down to chapter preference on when they want to host events or if they feel they're hosting too many or not enough. It's really an individual organization decision. And then the follow-up to that is what are the like processes and procedures in place uh, to promote safety at the social events on and off campus? Um, yeah, for sure. So we have a pretty, we have a, I think we have a pretty robust policy when it comes to student group and events with alcohol. Um, you know, no events can have any alcohol content above a 15% APV. So we do try to take pretty seriously what it looks like with um, any type of alcohol consumption for anyone who's 21 or older. Um, we typically require that any events in our facilities and any events that are off campus, there has to be a set number of, um, I'm trying to remember what the exact wording we use is, I always want to default to sober monitors or party marshals because that is the, the wording that I know. Yes, uh, it is sober monitors. It is and sober monitor here, <laughs> yeah. not party marshals. Um, no. And so we have a set number of those people who are required to be sober at every event. Uh, not every event. They're required to be sober at the events that they are sober monitors for. Um, They have to have a, let's be well documented who is the sober monitor. They have to be easily accessible, easily contact, easily contact, easy, be able to easily contact them. There we go. I was not going to get contactable out and it didn't even feel like it was a real word. Uh, and so they have to be easy to get a hold of. We often require security at our off campus events that are happening. Um, we require the security guards to turn in post event forms on how it went. Or just, and so there's a lot of pieces that we really try to make sure that we're looking out for the student well being when these events are happening. I'll add a few more pieces to that. Um, and this applies to all of our student groups, not just our sororities and fraternities, but any student group that is hosting an event with alcohol has to also have security, professional security in attendance as part of that event. And there also have to be bartenders, licensed bartenders that are not our students um, that come from outside have certificates of insurance, all of those pieces. And so, um, and those bartenders are the ones bringing the alcohol um, in compliance with our 15, you know, under 15% ABV. Um, and then food and non-alcoholic drinks also have to be available enough for every potential attendee at the, at the event, whether it's on or off campus. So those are some of our pieces. We also require that any event with alcohol transportation is provided if it is off campus. And so uh, whether that's um, using, you know, a bus or a charter or um, or the student group providing vouchers for ride chairs. And uh, we, you know, we go through all of this. Any student group that wants to host an event with alcohol actually has to have that event approved. They have to go through training in advance um, for both their event coordinators and their sober monitors. Uh, we do take that really seriously. I will also say that um, while 
you know, certainly the best security is students looking out for other students. And we certainly hope that that culture exists on campus. WPD is also a very present um, force. I don't want to use that word, but <laughs> a very present uh, group on campus. And they are always kind of trying to make sure that students are safe. You know, their goal is not to be punitive. It's really to make sure students are safe, they get home safe, they get help when they need it. Um, we have several, in addition to emergency services that are outside of campus, we have several peer-led services as well on campus, including Uncle Joe's, which is mental health um, support. And um, and there's many more related to like relationship and sexual violence, but also um, EST, our emergency support team, which is actually students who are on campus and they are um, trained and certified first responders. And they are often kind of the first ones called if, if a student is struggling. And the reason for that is that peers, students trust their peers usually, and they are often quick to call um, for that support. And our students are the ones that are trained professionally and have that professional oversight, but they're also going in to really support students and make sure they stay safe. So safety is certainly our goal. Um, and we do tend to find, well, certainly bad things happen and we don't want to deny that. Um, we do tend to find that, especially on campus, our students tend to remain fairly safe or they do know how to ask for help. Great, thank you both for those. Okay, kind of switching gears a little bit, knowing this might be timely for, um, I almost said October, but we're almost in October. So this time, September slash October. Um, how do you all recommend students prepare to apply for competitive student groups, chapters that involve like tryouts, auditions, applications, et cetera? and also prepare for, you know, hearing back kind of whatever way that goes? Yeah, that is a great question. And one we get a lot because we do have some really incredible sports groups, performing arts groups, um, you know, various groups that do require some kind of audition or tryout, um, which a lot of that has really already started. <laughs> I know a lot of our acapella groups do tryouts like right at the start of the school year. Um, and I, I think a lot of our sports clubs do as well. So a lot of those processes are, are already underway. Um, in terms of preparation, I would say certainly connecting with members of the student group. We have, um, within WUGO, there is a way to, um, under each student group, there's a link that students should be able to click that will take them to an Excel that really documents. We ask them a lot of questions in their re-registration process about um, selectivity of groups, right? Do you require an application? Do you require an interview or a tryout or some kind of audition? What does that process look like? Who is deciding who gets in? Um, really trying to demystify a lot of that. And so I do really wanna point students to that resource or certainly they can always just connect with our office and we can get them that. Um, all groups are kind of listed in that, all groups who re-registered. So that information is readily available and we do hope students will utilize it. And if they are seeing or hearing something that does not align with that, because that is the group self-reporting, please let us know and please reach out to us because we really do want students to be um, truthful in describing the, you know, the process to get into a student group. Um, I think connecting with current members of the group is super important to really find out what does that process look like? What, um, really asking them, you know, what do I need to know? Some sport clubs are not exclusive and they really are happy to take anybody regardless of their skill level. Some that's not true, right? And performing arts groups certainly um, that's sort of similar. Um, there are a lot of performing arts groups who don't compete. And so they are also happy to take anybody. So it really depends on the group. Um, but I think connecting with some of the current members and asking a lot of those questions is really important. And then I would also say, um, I think it's important that we talk about, you know, students as they navigate, if they are not selected for those groups, um, which we know can be really difficult and challenging. And certainly if there are issues at play, um, a student, you know, again, like I said, if, if what the group is doing is not matching with what they disclosed in their process, like reaching out to our office so that we can really kind of look into that and help support. Um, but also, you know, I, I hate to say that's right, but rejection is a part of life sometimes. And, um, and sometimes there are just, I know this in terms of our acapella groups, they have so many students that audition and they, they certainly can't take everyone. Right. Um, and so I think being prepared, like, as parents, I hope you have those conversations with your students. And um, I have to imagine most students have experienced some kind of rejection before this point, but um, really how do you kind of
Must be some bad Wi-Fi tonight. Um, I uh, certainly we have mental health resources as well because we know that can be really challenging. Um, and then again, if they're not a senior, <laughs> uh, really want to encourage. And I apologize if my internet's cutting out again. Um, but really want to encourage students to try again in future years, because that is a great opportunity to keep practicing and hopefully getting better and have a chance to join later on in their career. Uh, and then I would just say, I think if any groups are uh, interested in joining fraternities and sororities and they kind of uh, go through recruitment or they go through intake or maybe they're not selected to go through intake or maybe they're not selected uh, through recruitment. I know that very like occasionally we do run into people who um, even go all the way through the recruitment process and do not receive a bid at the end of it. That's very rare for Panhellenic sorority, though. I think we had one woman out of um, a good amount of them um, who did not receive a bid. Uh, and so it's really, it's very rare for that to happen through the Panhellenic process, I feel like, um, through uh, intake with our MPHC organization, it is possible. Intake with us, Alpha State Lambda, it is possible. Um, with IFC, it's also possible to go through the recruitment process and still not end up with a bid. Um, some of those organizations have their own membership criteria and those are kind of private membership organizations that we have uh, we have a relationship with and so it just really kind of depends on what you're looking for something I always tell students though who try to join organizations maybe they're not selected uh, is that especially on a campus where there's over 400 student organizations there's always something else that you could try to join or always another place that you could find involvement and so I think it's really trying to figure out maybe if I wasn't like picked to be in this specific organization, maybe I wasn't picked to join this club, like what are the other ways that I can still find involvement and things that I enjoy doing? Um, is whether that is just kind of spending more time with friends, potentially starting your own organization. And so it's really kind of finding the way forward for what you want to do and what you want to get out of your college organization or college career. Um, and it doesn't always have to be tied to an organization that you're involved in. Great, thank you. Okay, then um, this is kind of going back. I know you all spoke to the safety measures and protocols for events. We did have a question asking specifically about hazing prevention that WASHU provides. So what does hazing prevention look like? Um, and Zachary, you can speak to it, though I know it's broader to all student groups as well, not just sorority and fraternity life. But what does hazing prevention look like at WashU? And then if you can touch just a little bit upon like where people can go to learn more about like the student group conduct process in general, because people asked about outcomes too. Um, absolutely. So we actually have done a lot of really cool and exciting work um, around our hazing prevention and education pieces over the summer that we are, I think, are implementing this fall. I mean, we've started to implement already. Um, a lot of that work was done in collaboration with someone on Sarah's team and also our OSCCS, our Office yeah. of Student Conduct and Community Standards. And so we really tried to implement some new pieces around hazing. And I'll let Sarah yeah. talk a little bit more about those if, if they're implemented and what kind of what that looks like. But we're really trying to build out um, a educational component and module that all students will take, all first year students will take, and then we'll kind of build it into the uh, greater culture of WashU. And so what we're seeing is we're hoping to put that in with our new hazing definition, our new hazing standalone policies. Um, right now, we do a lot of hazing prevention conversations. Um, I do a lot of work with our fraternity and sorority life community. Uh, I do a lot of conversation and collaborating with Cole Fournier, who's our coordinator of education and compliance, who's on Sarah's team around what is the best way to like educate and have these conversations with our fraternities and sororities. Um, we also typically put that same information out into student groups. Um, I know that that training is also available to them as well. If you are concerned, though, about any potential um, hazing issues that are happening, we always recommend that you contact our office. You're more than welcome to give me a call. I think my name is currently the name listed on the website, and so is my phone number. Uh, there is a hazing prevention website and policy that you can find. I'm not sure the ex where it's housed exactly, but I know it's on it's through our conduct office, OSCCS. Um, and so I think I'm listed there as our current contact. You're more than welcome to reach out to Sarah. You can reach out to our general campus life email. You can reach out to Cole specifically. Um, there are also forms that you can submit if you are concerned, like you're able to submit an anonymous form as well um, that you can find on our, I think it's on our website. I know it's on the OSCCS website. I often just Google wash you incident reporting form. And then I like pick the link I need if I know that I need to submit something. Uh, but I know that we are really trying a lot of new and exciting ways to handle hazing prevention that I do want Sarah to touch on more than I can, or better than I can. 
Yeah, so um, kind of going back to the training piece, we did roll out a new module for all first year students this year, and that will be the standard going forward. Um, it's part of their on their orientation and onboarding. There's several modules they have to go through. Um, so we do really talk from just an educational standpoint about like what is hazing and recognizing it. Um, and we've already seen students respond to us saying, I have concerns maybe about something I've experienced um, based on what I learned in training. So can I talk through them? Um, we also go through our hazing prevention training with all of our um, recognized student group officers. And I can't really speak to, certainly there are other student spaces across campus that hazing might be present. Um, you know, our college athletics is one of them. I I would have to point you to their office for questions about what they might be doing. Um, but for any of our student groups, our students groups officers have all go, gone through that training. In terms of the conduct piece, it really does start with um, a report. Uh, we have to find out about something potentially happening. And we do take those reports really seriously. Um, I will say the challenge is often we hear anecdotally from students that such and such haze, such and such, but it never gets reported to us. Um, and we can't really do anything if we don't have any details. So please, 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 if you hear something, if you are on this call because they have both submitted questions to us saying, hey, I noticed this, hey, I paid attention to this. Um, and we then can dig into it. Um, so really through that process, how that works is an investigation would begin. Um, and depending on the severity, it kind of depends on where that investigation might start. Um, and if it is a recognized student group or not, um, so it's a partnership really between Campus Life, Cole Hornier, who Zach mentioned, um, who works with our student group conduct, as well as our Office of Student Conduct and Community Standards. And they would investigate, you know, whatever information they have. That might be, um, depending on the scope of that, that could mean calling in students who are members or might have been privy to information and asking them to try to find out more details. That could include um, various pieces of evidence, whether it's um, camera footage, police reports, so on and so forth, right? Whatever, essentially whatever we can find to try to get a complete picture of what happened. And then depending on what happened or didn't happen, um, but if something did happen, then they would go through the conduct process. Um, if it was a student group or any student really, they would get a notice of charges, um, potential charges of what they're being charged with. A charge is not the same as an outcome. Um, so they're, they will be notified. Uh, it's like a I'm trying to think of what the legal process, um, a summons or whatnot, uh, a citation where it's saying, we are alleging that this happened. Um, so then student groups or students would go through the process and they would have an opportunity for a hearing where they would come and meet with, um, depending on what happened, they would meet with either an administrative you know, hearing officer, whether that be in our office or conduct, or um, potentially, depending on the situation, potentially up to a hearing board. Usually there would always be a meeting before it would go to a hearing board um, to talk through the process and all of those things. You can check both um, for sure on the student conduct website. Um, it really lays out the process really well. Um, we just got a new website, so I'm not entirely sure how well our process is laid out on our website. So I will follow up on that and check. Um, but really, you know, the hearing is really just the chance for students to say, to respond to what been, they've been charged with, right? So saying, um, telling us their version of events. They might be asked questions. They can certainly ask questions throughout that process. And then whoever the body is that's hearing that, whether it's a board or an individual, um, they would make a determination about, is it more likely than not that this happened? Um, in higher education, we use what's called a preponderance of the evidence standard. So it's like 50.1% sure. It is not the same as the criminal standard because this also does not have criminal court outcomes. Although certainly hazing is also against Missouri law. And so um, if there is substantial evidence that it happened, it could also be turned over to the state to go through a criminal process. Um, but really, the decision would be made, is it more likely than not that this happened based on all the evidence and everything that we have? Um, and then a determination would be made and sanction was, would be issued if they are found responsible. Um, and so a sanction is, um, you know, kind of the follow up, act, the follow up activity. We really try to come from this educational lens. Um, there are times where there are social probations put in place um, or different kinds of activity restriction. Um, sometimes we have groups that really the issue occurred with their new exec onboarding process. And so they might have a specific restriction around recruitment and new officer onboarding that we will 
really work through them and we really want them to learn here's where you went wrong and how do we do this better going forward. Um, and then there's likely ed other educational pieces, including potentially likely a training on hazing, um, really kind of connecting it to the specific incident at hand. So I'm unsure when she's going to phase back in, um, yeah. <clears throat> but we do really try to tailor any outcomes that come through our accountability process to what has actually happened. Um, something that we've taken pretty seriously, it's really kind of reframed the way that we handle our in-house conduct. Uh, when we look at student group cases that come before um, our in-house conduct, it's really what has been done, what are the best ways in which we can actually remedy this and really try to provide um, education to the organizations that are going through it so that they understand that this is actually we're trying to help them to get through the conduct process we're not really trying to um like heavily punish anyone we really want to make sure that we're focusing on those more restorative pieces of what are the way that we can kind of restore or repair the harm that has been caused here and how do we make sure that we are educating to ensure that these things don't happen again in the future and that's something that we've taken very seriously in the time that i've been here i think it's kind of always been the general um, operating procedure for campus life to really kind of align what those outcomes look like with what has actually happened to make sure that we are um, really doing our best to educate student groups moving forward so they don't make the same mistakes. Great. Thank you both so much. Um, so one last quick question, because I know we need to kind of wrap this up, but I want to be able to leave parents and family members with maybe one more piece of advice from each of you. What is one piece of advice you'd give to a parent or family member if their student is currently struggling to get involved or to feel connected on campus? That is a great question. Um, usually my advice to parents at orientation or something is get, make sure your student gets involved. But if they're struggling to feel involved or connected, um, I mean, certainly you can reach out to us. their student can reach out to us. We want to help them find the right opportunity for them and find a place. Um, I will say that it is often it often feels scary at first, but our students largely are very welcoming and they have all been kind of through the same process. And so um, even if it's starting small, like I mentioned before, in terms of that spectrum of engagement, just going to an event, we host so many events on campus that you don't have to already be part of a group. You don't have to come with anybody else. Um, so really just come to one thing and try to talk to somebody new that you haven't met um, and see where it goes from there. Um, we don't want it to feel overly complicated. Um, you don't have to be in a group and many of our groups, you can just show up to their things and you don't even have to be a member. Campus is flyered with things to do at all times. And so I would say just show up to any of them. Um, if they're flyering, it means they want people to be there. So um, just show up and see if you can connect and, um, but certainly reach out to us if you feel like you're having a hard time. Um, I definitely echo a little bit of what Sarah said. Just show up to an event. If you go into WUGO, you can see upcoming events that are open to the public that student groups are hosting. So you're able to go to those. Um, any events that are passive that you're seeing in the duck or around the duck on Edison, feel free to just stop in, uh, say hello, uh, meet someone new. I think it's really just about trying to put yourself out there and find a way to get involved. I know it can feel very isolating to come to college and and really feel like you can't find your way, but I think it always, it just comes down to showing up to events and and just trying to meet someone new. Um, our student groups are hosting events all the time. Campus Life is hosting events pretty frequently. Uh, I think selfishly, I would always encourage anyone to join a fraternity or sorority. I think the data shows pretty clearly that uh, joining a fraternity and sorority typically leads to a higher sense of belonging, a higher sense of affinity for the college that you attend. And so I think that anecdotally, what I've always heard um, from our pretty involved students, not just our fraternity and sorority leaders, is they often feel much more connected uh, to WashU. They feel more connected to their studies. They feel more connected to those around them uh, because they took the chance in getting involved somewhere, somewhere along the way. Uh, and so I think it just really comes down to taking that first step to show up to an event that you've seen on a flyer, that you see on the Campus Live Instagram, or that you've seen on Wugo, and just uh, trying to put yourself out there is kind of what I would always recommend. I want to follow up with one more quick piece of advice, um, because I know sometimes there are costs associated with being involved in student group activity or extracurriculars. Um, so I want to point to a resource called the Opportunity Fund that is under the umbrella of the Taylor Family Center for Student Success, the Student Success Fund, um, which is really a fund to help support 
extracurricular, co-curricular involvement on campus. Um, it was endowed by the student union years ago. And really students just need to apply and show, um, kind of show proof of that there's this cost for attendance, whether it's a uniform or, um, you know, supplies or whatever, equipment, maybe if they're in a sport club or something like that. Um, so we really don't want cost to be a barrier to participation. Um, that can also apply to dues if there's a group that charges dues to be part of. Um, so please, if, if that's one of the challenges in getting involved, please check out the Opportunity Fund. Um, and certainly we can always point you there as well if you stop by our office, but we wanna make sure that you know that that's a resource. Um, students put it together for other students because they recognize um, that cost shouldn't be a barrier to getting involved on campus. Great, Sarah, Zachary, thank you again so much for all the information you provided, for the answers you gave. Families, we hope you learned valuable information tonight. As a reminder, the recording of this webinar will be available on our families.washu.edu website by like Monday next week, if not before. And um, we're sharing a pre-recorded conversation about academic support and our October family ties. And our next live webinar is a conversation about study abroad on Wednesday, October 9th at 5.30 p.m. Central. Um, so you can register for that and any upcoming webinars at families.washu.edu. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their night. And thank you again for joining us. All right.